right, welcome back, everybody, to the Weather Pods Disaster Relief Telethon. We're here all day supporting the American Red Cross and their disaster relief efforts. You know, we're, we're getting ready for Thanksgiving, and a lot of us are going to share some great time with friends and family uh, in, in shelter and homes. And not everybody's going to have that opportunity because of weather disasters, natural disasters. And so we're really using this time an opportunity to to help those that that need help and uh, what's great is we're already over uh two thousand one hundred dollars in donations so i want to thank everybody that's been involved in that we've been sharing names here as we go um and and so any donations you make uh on our site again you can you can click either on the qr code in the upper left hand corner of of the stream that you're watching or you can go to bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash W-X pods telethon. Uh, go to that website as well. And, and that's that's where you can make donations. And, and as they come in, we'll, we'll certainly recognize you and thank you for, uh, for helping to do that. I am excited because this is the hour that we get to have, we get to have a reunion show. Like if you grew up like me watching uh, Chips, and Dukes of Hazard <laughs> yeah. and, wow. bunch and all those shows. And then like, nice. if, you know, a few years later, they'd have a reunion special and you're like, oh, this is going to be, this is going to be great. So we are having a Stormfront Freaks podcast reunion with Kim Cunningham, former meteorologist at the Weather Channel. Kim, it's so good to see you. It's been a couple of years, but welcome back and welcome to the telethon. Oh, it's so great to be back and great to see all of you. <laughs> you all look the same. The only difference <laughs> Phil has a jacket on. I know, isn't it's, it? It's a telethon. I mean, we're 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 trying to red carpet this a little bit, but uh, we've yeah. got we've got some of our co-hosts, Jen Watson, Dina Knightley, Mark Masmasaro, and Serena Arnold, uh, all with us today for for kind of this special reunion. So I hope some of our Stormfront Freaks listeners and viewers are are checking in. But uh, Kim, before because I'm sure all these uh, all of our other friends co-hosts here have questions. I, I just want to know what what have you been up to? What what are you doing right now? We've missed you. Uh, give us a little Kim Cunningham update. <laughs> well, it's been crazy. I don't know if any of you guys have ever built a house from afar. Um, as you know, the, one of the reasons I dropped out was just because we had to start from scratch building a house in 25 acres and adding a barn, a barn dominium to go along with it. My father-in-law may be moving into it. So it's been traveling back and forth between here and Hartwell, which is close to South Carolina. And then working, I've been working a lot for Speechworks, traveling more and more, it seems like. So between all of that, um, my son is out of school now. So I'm kind oh of- Oh my God, um, already? Yeah, Alex is done. Oh, so wow. That's amazing. Yeah, so he's, you know- since he has special needs, I'm I'm busy with trying to get him to places, keep him occupied. Um, and also I'm kind of back to like teaching a little bit with him because I'm trying to keep him, you know, he, it's routine for them. So I have to continuously write your name, things like that. So it's been, I wouldn't change it for the world, but it has been crazy. I'm just so happy I could see you guys. Hey, Kim, I hear it's it's been said you with all the stress of building a house, you should be married at least 10 years or it could be disastrous. So. <laughs> She's got Marty. Marty's great. Marty, he's a rock, you know, and I will say there are some challenges because I don't know about you guys, but my husband has opinions on color. No uh, way. Oh yeah. Oh, decorating. I didn't the... expect that. Really? I expected opinions on like where the stairs are going and the light switches. Yeah. I did not expect oh. colors to come out of your mouth. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so this is, it's been, it's been interesting, but um, <laughs> he goodness. doesn't paint everything black though. Does he? No. My husband would paint everything black <laughs> if he could. <laughs> well, his office, there is some black on some of the walls and yeah. like Georgia colors, but, um, but yeah, there for a while, all his vehicles were black. So I get that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's been interesting. Um, the good thing is we do agree on a lot of things. So it's been, is it's, the house done? Are you guys done with it or are you yeah, still? Yeah, we should be moving in January. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. You're not, okay. It's crazy. And I'm not in the basement because the basement is a mess right now. So we're 
trying to go through things and getting rid of stuff. So including probably Christmas trees. But, and oh, that's what I was going to ask you. Do you still have the upside down Christmas tree? I do. You got to keep that. And it's, I, I just don't know if we have room for it. We really downsized. So Marty's like, put it in your office. You know, it's, you don't have to worry about room because you know, it goes down like this. Mm -hmm. So you don't really have to worry about taking up too much space. But I have a friend of mine up the street, he actually um, is a meteorologist. He graduated from University of Alabama, Huntsville this last summer. He's a huge weather geek. <laughs> and um, I kind of mentored him all these years. So if I get rid of it, it's probably going to go to him. And I have to explain to everyone who hasn't been to Kim's house during the holidays. <laughs> Kim, if it, first of all, it's stunning and beautiful with the decoration but there's like 12 15 christmas trees fully decorated christmas trees including the tornado one like it is glorious <laughs> i mean i um, walk into kim's house and it's like it's officially christmas like it's amazing thank you thanks it's it's i love it um this year we downsized <laughs> we only did that's seven. still a lot of work though we gosh seven. it's a lot of work wait you downsized and did how many seven. Like seven. Uh, seven. Seven. Right. <laughs> i'll tell you my kids still remember her house i love that that's they what do. i want they do that's what mm -hmm. i want i want memories i want people to come in and just feel like it's christmas and happy and um love it you know because we come off of halloween where we scare the living daylights out of, our, <laughs> out of kids because um, we do it up for halloween too so you know i have to bring the good in after that but yeah yeah so so kim we see the uh, georgia bulldog shirt um yeah. but you've lived in so many different places how many teams would you have to be wearing right now oh gosh oh geez let's see uh, one, Ohio State, <laughs> Ohio State, five, five, six, Bengals. maybe six, six teams. Maybe. So yeah, I've been in Georgia the longest though. Yeah. So, you know, you know, I, I know, I know you yeah. have, you know, I was only in Ohio for 18, 19 years. Yeah. So, um, it's kind of home, you know, even though my family's still in Cincinnati, I still go there a lot, mm -hmm. um, in between all this. Cause my mom, um i'm trying to get up there to see her as much as possible as possible but hopefully she's coming down um in december so oh good yeah oh you're gonna make her help move in or something yeah. she, <laughs> <grab> <laughs> <a> lamp. <laughs> she can get the big boxes <laughs> she can everything she would trust me but yeah. oh as i'm hoping so, anyway. so speaking of so you mentioned ohio and that you were yeah. there that not quite as long as you've been in Georgia for the 18, 19 years. Uh, tell us a little bit about the Cincinnati tornado that uh, you grew up with. Yeah, that was that's what got me into weather. Well, you know, I say that, but then I was interested when I watched, of course, a lot of you, The Wizard of Oz is a big, a big beginning for a lot of people in weather. Um, so that got me interested. But then when I saw a tornado um, back in 1974, it was the super outbreak of April 3rd and 4th, the most tornadoes at that time in a 24 hour period. So 148. So we were eating dinner and it was around, it was about 5.30 ish, somewhere in there. And my, we heard there were tornado mornings all day long, actually. And at that time, which was kind of, you guys, some of you know this, some of you don't, you're too young. But back then it was pretty much a radio. You know, they would break in on the TV once in a while, you only had three stations to look at, but it was really, you were following on the radio. So we had the map out and we were tracking where they were saying, okay, it's being sighted here. We were looking on a map and we we're like, oh, wow. You know, this, this is, could be, if it's going, keeps going this direction, could be pretty close to us. Well, my brother said, well, I'm gonna go out and look. And he went outside and saw it and came in and said, it's out there. So we ran oh my out God. There. We ran out and stood on the deck. It's a deck that faces to the West. And we've got this beautiful view and you could see it. And at that time it was causing F3 damage. But Ooh. when it was in Sailor Park, it was F5 damage. So it had weakened, but it was still the classic funnel supercell. And we just tried, we just watched it. And my dad finally said, cause it was getting closer. And he's like, get in the basement. So we ran down to the basement 
And, you know, we were praying and crying. We could hear it, but it missed us to the north. So when my mom left the storm cellar, and because she's kind of like me, she's an adrenaline junkie. She's like, I have to go to the bathroom, but she didn't, have to, she didn't want to go out and see. So she runs out there. She comes back and come out of here, kids. And we all ran outside and you could see it. It was dissipating over on West Fork Road and all the debris was flying out of it. It was just, it was mesmerizing, but terrifying at the same time. So after that, we went out and collected a lot of debris and things that actually were from Sailor Park, which was 10 miles away from us. Wow. Um, wow. And so and the west side of Cincinnati is very hilly. And at that time, and you guys probably knew this, there was that myth that tornadoes don't, don't track up hills. They don't go over mountains. So, you know, we all had this kind of false sense of security that, oh, shoot, if it's coming up the west side of Cincinnati, there's so many hills, we're not going to have to worry about it. But um, that was not true. But we did, I think we did open all the windows. <laughs> <laughs> I could just see like your mom going like, I got to go pee. She runs, she comes back, her hair is all messy. Like, okay, I'm good. Yeah. She doesn't tell anybody. I wasn't doing anything. I wasn't doing anything. Oh, I would have been mom so like the, <laughs> Kim's mom's like the OG storm chaser really of all time. And we all oh. don't know. We're all just figuring that out. <laughs> and you know, she, um, mom and she joined the us uh, she was a spotter everything after that so my family they were all part of the whole spotter group there uh for a long time so it's kind of in our blood but anyway so that's it Serena I don't know was there anything else <laughs> no it's just such a cool story it's just you know phenomenal to hear and um to be a part of that outbreak you know the big 74 I mean there's not many people in weather I think that don't know about that so it's just fantastic to hear yeah. And you know, the cool, the, for me, the a highlight of the weather channel was actually working with Dr. Greg Forbes because, you know, he's the one who studied, you know, the whole outbreak with Ted Fujita. And so when I, and I knew that. So when, when I heard he was coming to the weather channel, I was like, you know, goo goo eyed, you know, like, oh my God, <laughs> the man, Dr. Greg Forbes. And I just picked his brain like every day asking about because he was, he finally signed one of those, um, the map that hit all the tornado, you know, that they did where they actually tracked all the tornadoes that day. He signed it for me and gave it to Aww. me. I got it framed. So anyway, that's amazing. Oh my Weather God, Channel, what a great piece. I should yeah. say when you're at the Weather Channel, does yeah. everybody have their own city that they're really, you know, you're like, oh, stuff going on in Cincinnati. I got this. Or, you know. Do you mean that? Um, we talk about our hometowns more than usual or a certain town that we love. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Does everybody have their favorite spot? And so they're all like, I got this part, you know, probably I had, you know, my mom would say, gosh, you talk about Cincinnati a lot. <laughs> You've got to not talk. <laughs> but How can you not? It's, I know. it's love. <laughs> That's what I said. Every time I say Cincinnati, you know, I'm thinking of you, <laughs> but yeah, I think so. I think so. And I think the same thing about types of weather too that a lot of um, meteorologists and television, they have their favorite type, right? We all, mine was tornadoes, you know, Cantores with snowstorms, you know, so hurricanes, um, gosh, who, who was big down there? Um, oh, I forget who else was. Uh, everybody had their Florida niche, State, you know? Florida State, everybody has their niche. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so that's, I mean, you kind of stuck with those as well. So it's kind of, you had your favorites, a little bit of everything there. It's always helpful when you're from someplace and you know, the terrain, you know, the area, and that just gives you a little bit more help on, on what you think is going to happen. So very true because I could name all the interstates, I mean, all the <laughs> little things going on. Some of the, and restaurants. you name the towns, right? You don't, you don't say <laughs> you the name said, wrong. That's right. You don't so, say but Montana. <laughs> So Kim, what, what, I guess, what, what are, what are you doing to still stay connected to, to weather? What, what are your, um, uh, what do they call it? Your indulgences that you still see yourself uh, doing daily or weekly or monthly that, that still keeps you connected? Well, I think friends and family, because they will text me, Kim, what's going on? You know, here, I've got this still. going on. <laughs> so, but pivotal weather, I'm on there all the time. You know, I'm just double checking, yeah. see what's going on, look at the models. Um, that's really it. Um, I follow, you know, some people on Twitter. Um, I'll jump on there once in a while. I'm not on there, on X, excuse me. Mm -hmm. 
not on there a lot, but I'll get on once in a while. But that's really it. I've been so busy, okay. Phil. Yeah. You know, um, I, I I look forward to when things calm down. I see a year from now because it's probably going to take us a whole year um, to really get settled in. And, um, you know, when you move, you got to find doctors, all that stuff. So, oh, yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, we we miss you, Kim. And, and it do. was great that at least for 15 to 20 minutes, we had a chance to have our chips reunion, if nothing else. Uh, <laughs> love it's, it. it's It's been a lot of fun. So good to see you. We love you. Uh, good luck w- with all of that. Um, and you know, if you always have a home here with the freak. So if you uh, need anything, don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, everybody. Cool. I miss you guys. Have a nice great Nice to see you. Evening. All right. So we're going to keep rolling on with the telethon. Uh, don't forget, you can uh, donate, help us out, share the word, whatever you need to do uh, to help us raise. We're still shooting and climbing to $3,000. So see what you can do to be a part of that. We're going to be right back with Storm Chaser Michael Binsky. So stay tuned. The climate crisis is upending millions of lives across the country and around the globe. We are witnessing a striking number of natural disasters with greater severity than ever before. In fact, the number of billion dollar disasters in the U.S. has increased by 70% over the past decade. The number of families affected will continue to rise in both volume and suffering. However, these disasters leave their most profound mark on low-income communities, as well as those who are older or living with disabilities. The people most impacted by climate disasters are already the most vulnerable. The devastation has a compounding effect on these communities, and we need your help in the face of this humanitarian crisis. Your support is critical and will help the American Red Cross remain at the front lines to provide aid as disasters intensify. As a leading disaster responder in the U.S., we're launching nearly twice as many relief operations than we did a decade ago in response to unrelenting and overlapping disasters. And sadly, many of the same communities are ravaged repeatedly. This crisis has stretched our ability to provide life-saving meals, shelter, health and mental health services, financial aid, and more to people with no place else to go. That's why we're expanding our capacity to deliver emergency aid, enhancing our large-scale relief and recovery services, using innovation where we can, and growing partner support networks in disaster-prone communities. Internationally, we're implementing new programs to reduce climate disaster risks in some of the most vulnerable high population areas. We're also creating grassroots pre-disaster plans and engaging with youth leaders to expand their local impact. We each play a role in responding to this crisis. So at the American Red Cross, we are also doing our part to reduce our own environmental footprint through cutting emissions, waste, and water use. Even with all of these efforts combined, we need to do more. With your help, the American Red Cross will invest $1.1 billion over the next five years to meet the growing needs of this humanitarian crisis. Your commitment ensures we can continue to help those who need it most. All right, welcome back to the Weather Pods Disaster Relief Telethon. Uh, we're we're continuing to move on, and and we have got a great guest with us. and And I, I'll say this: so Michael Binsky is with us, Storm Chaser. He's a filmmaker. Uh, he, he might, and, and I should look, but he might hold the record for the most appearances on the Stormfront Freaks of any guest that we've had. It might Ooh. be five, maybe, wow. or something like that. Really. But, but, he, That's you know, as, as Saturday Night Live, they always like promote. They're like, <laughs> I'm the five timer, five timers. <laughs> and, and, yeah. So, so Mike, you might be holding the jacket for the first time, five timer. Oh my uh, God. In Storm no We're not going to count this because this is uh, <laughs> weather pods and we got a bunch of other great people involved. I do want to do this, Mike, before we get to you. 
Uh, we've got Tim Pounds, Jared Smith, and uh, James Briarton with Carolina Weather Group that are behind the scenes They're all day today. They are, are bringing in our guests into the green room and our co-host and moving people in and out and coordinating all the breaks and all this stuff. And these guys are doing a tremendous job. So just a, a shout out to them as well. And again, we've got Dina, Serena, and Maz from Stormfront Freaks with us. So, Mike, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump to you. And and before the co-hosts get to their questions, first off, welcome to the to the telethon. But I, I want to know you've seen as a storm chaser. I'm sure you've stumbled upon a number of disasters after the fact when you storm chase. And I guess I'm you you've always done a good job of of being at a distance with some of your great time-lapse yeah. stuff, but I'm sure you've, you've come across something. What, I guess what's been most memorable to you? Um, well, like you said, it's kind of interesting. I, I get all twisted with that because I don't tend to hang back enough. So if there's a, a storm, I tend to be in front of it because I'm trying to capture it coming at me and I'm a little obsessed with that. And that kind of ruins me. I had to list last year. I had to take a break and go on the backside of a storm by Roswell and just get the erupting storm moving away. And it was stunning. But even then I was mad because I saw the supercell structure <laughs> pick photos from other people on the other side and I was jealous. So I don't tend to like, so if there's a big tornado or something that hits something, I don't, I'm not usually there. And I know it's one of those things where if I go back, um, sometimes you're in the way and stuff. And I just, I haven't been around the real damaging one other than Winnie Wood. And that one was so crazy. And that was early on for me. So I think what I tend to see a lot because I chase the monsoon out here more than anything mm -hmm. is a lot of um, I see cars that have been that like hydroplaned a lot out here because they don't they're racing 75, 85 on the on the Arizona you know highways and a in a big thunderstorm will just um, drowns the freeway. And then I was doing a BBC show with these um, with these film crew. And we were driving and it's pouring rain. I'm like, this is the kind of stuff that's dangerous as people hydroplane in this. And I've seen cars flipped over and seen tires still spinning. And, and so sure enough, we turned around and went back that day to film something else. And there was a car and police around it that had hydroplane into the median. So I tend to see that stuff. I feel like a little more um, than I've seen like a really big kind of like disaster, I guess. So. Now, where are you? Where are you again? Because I see cactus in the background. <laughs> <laughs> um, I live in Phoenix, Arizona. It's my I'm born and raised, lived here for um, 48 and a half years. So it's a wonderful place to live. What What's the monsoon? What was the monsoon season like this year? What? Uh... Um, it sucked. It was, yeah. I didn't see a lot about it. So I assume that was no, your answer. Um, last year, like I kind of did um, determine how great or how active a storm was based on the number of days that I have. Uh, photographs in Lightroom um, and so last year 2022 I had like 45 days I chased a monsoon which you know from it started mid-June like June 18th and I was still chasing storms like October 10th which was crazy wow and yeah, it was a crazy incredible. monsoon that was and that was 2022 2023 the it, it was like a it started two or three weeks late like there was no storms to chase till middle of july and then it ended early september basically and that was it i think i had like 23 chase days compared to like 45 the year before hmm. so wow. it was very um it just was not very good um there were there was a few stretches i got some nice pictures because you know when you get out there and work hard and and are on the these storms a lot you can you can kind of make magic out of that even a poor season but um and there was some good lightning storms and, and some fun stuff but yeah definitely not not as good and very hot uh in the phoenix area and you know probably other places in the desert it was we had a stretch um and i can't remember now because i'm getting too old to remember like dates and records but we had 110 <laughs> plus temperatures for like a month or two straight it or was something. brutal oh, this God. summer and there are That's like awful. Um, I had a ficus tree out front that they they do good out here. You know, it lost. It must have lost like a third of its leaves. I had like piles of leaves I was raking up once a week underneath it, like it had shed its leaves for the fall because it just got so shocked from the heat. And then there was places where saguaro, maybe they were replanted somewhere, like the desert botanical gardens or somewhere, but they were falling over, dying because of the heat. And you're like. 
uh, cactus can't take the heat, then there's How something you really wrong. That heat? <laughs> yes. That's what I yeah. don't understand. So yeah. uh, it, for me, it was a sure, you know, I'm I'm looking around the valley and it's not just the ficus trees. There were other trees that were turning brown this summer. I'm like, this is like the climate change kind of thing happening where we are now going with a stretch of days where it's 110 plus for so long that certain types of, you know, vegetation and, and trees and cactus, even it might be too much for them and they're not going to be able to, to survive here, you know, much longer. So yeah. Yeah. Um, but it Mike, it, it only, only feels like a hundred, right? <laughs> no, it only feels like that is such crap. That is such crap, but no, it, it yeah. Everyone like it, it, when you're from here and you hear the, uh, it's a dry heat. It's sometimes, yeah, it's, you know, it's when it's, when it's like, uh, May or wherever, and it's 103, and the humidity is low, and at night it's 72. It's it's actually yeah, it's kind of a dry. You go in the shade, it's nice, but in the summer and in July when it's 112, Ugh. and there's still you know the dew point is still 55 degrees, and it only gets down to 95 at night for uh. a low. When you walk out of your out of your house at midnight to go on the patio, you're like, oh, I'm gonna. Maybe I'll sit on the patio and read a book and it's still 95 degrees. It's just, it's, it, it's kind of awful. So. Oh my yeah. God. So. This, this is making me far too uncomfortable. Let's, let's talk about super <laughs> self thunderstorms instead. Yes. Yeah. That's <laughs> more fun to me. <laughs> oh, oh my God. So, I mean, I love how you were saying, you know, you're, you're standing back, you know, we've got all kinds of storm chases that are joining us here today. Ones that think zero metering is the way to go and ones that don't. So yeah. talk to us a little bit for those who want to know more about, seeing that structure getting those pictures you have you have tours you've got some photography trips you've got ways for people to learn what you do and how you do right absolutely um i do um my kind of four tours um a spring for a week at a time and and they're very small i take i take them in my forerunner and there's usually two people maybe three sometimes i have someone help me the last few years i haven't and it's just been me and, I, and i'm kind of getting back to just doing it by myself it feels like and I've had people come along who've never done it before. There's a guy named Darren who um, lived in California, epic tattoo artist. And he went with us a few times. He was there for some really big days, this sublet um, supercell day. And we, and, he, and we saw these a couple of good tornadoes and stuff. And then he moved to Denver and chased the storms on his own. And I, this last year, I was south of 70, east of Lyman, um, shooting the supercell. And I pull up and there's Darren and this other girl, yeah. Paige. And I'm like, what's up, man? It's like, he went with us and learned kind of how it goes. And then now he that's moved so there and he's fun. doing it himself in the spare time. So um, so that's definitely a way, I think, to, um, to learn it safely. If you go out by yourself to want to learn it, that's how I did it. And you can do that. But then it it might take a little longer to get comfortable with, hey, how, how should I chase this? If you watch someone who knows what they're doing, then you can kind of get the strategy right away and then put that into practice. So I think that's very helpful. But did you get a tornado tat from him? No, <laughs> no. I do want no. to get a tattoo. I I, I haven't. I, I kind of want like a, a oh lightning God. one or my kid's names or something, but I, I need something like that, but I haven't haven't been able to figure out what it should I be. Think, I think I'm, I'm going to say this, Maz, when you finally get on one of our storm chase trips, we'll all, we'll all get some kind of a uh, chase tattoo or something. <laughs> to honor It'd be that funny time. to hire, we could hire Darren sometime to do hey, like Hey, Darren, a, can you meet us? Yeah, that would be That'd good. Be yeah, have him bring his yeah. ink and supplies and we'll, we'll hook up at a hotel and you can get your like the Stormfront Freaks logo or some kind of logo put on every have them do little logos for everybody. That'd be super funny. <laughs> Isn't Alec Baldwin going with us this next time? Oh god. Um, <laughs> uh, no. no. Not that I was aware of anyway. That's news to me. I, oh, so I nice. I'm gonna ask you this. So I Mike, I know you are a pop culture fan and freak. We're gonna get off the, the weather here a little bit. Uh, because I want to know. Uh, those of you that are fans of Marvel Cinematic Universe and the Marvel movies, of which Mike, uh, and you, this can be part of your uh, answer here, but Mike has actually got some footage in one of the Marvel movies. But I want to know what's what's happened to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It seems to not, not have the love and joy it had uh, a few years back. I saw an article pop up this week that, um, that they actually delaying two movies that were supposed to release next year to like 2025 now. And there's only one coming out because they're trying to figure out what's going on. And I, 
I remember when Disney Plus came about and they said, hey, we're going to do this uh, WandaVision series and we're going to do Loki and all these series. And then, and then they have all these new characters and movies. And I'm like, you know what? After Endgame, Endgame was. Yeah, the... after Endgame and no Captain America. Yeah, it was the but it was the perfect ending, like 22 movies. And then yeah. they decided, hey, we need more. We got to it's 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 the same. A lot of these shows and 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 pop culture like things have is that they make enough money like okay we got to do bigger and better more tv shows more and now it's just it's convoluted they're not as good you got to watch you know if you want to go watch the marvels i think you have to watch the miss marvel disney plus show to know who that is and i'm like i don't i just didn't i ran out of time for it and they've all you know the quality has gone down <laughs> but can i just see so. thor and captain america and be done with it <laughs> i know you know i was like hey Pretty much. you know they should just do one Avengers show a year, a series, and then a couple of movies, and that would be great. So what? So share. So share, Mike. Uh, the the film that you got some of your footage in, and how that came about. Um, it was uh, Thor two, and I, back then, uh, Reed Timmer and Tornado Videos .net, they had their their YouTube channel, and I my Booker Supercell time lapse that I had done had gone viral and was doing really good. And they published it for me as well on their channel, because back then they were published videos, split ad revenue. I'm like, I've only been doing this like three or four years. So I didn't even have a good YouTube channel at the time. And so because their channel was so big, someone saw it there and emailed um, them and they're like, Hey, email Mike, it's his video. And so it was like an email. I forget the name of the person, but it was from at Marvel Studios. And I was like, what? <laughs> and wow. I, got, I got very, very excited. And then, but of course, I'm, I had no idea, you know, how they're going to use it. And, you know, it could have been, it could have been anything. It could have been the background of a TV in the store window and been kind of pathetic. But then the movie came out. I had my, my name was in the credits because somebody in, in in Europe, they, it came out first and someone messaged me, goes, dude, why is your name at the end or at the end in the Thor 2 credits? Why? And I'm like, oh, my gosh, it is because I had kind of <laughs> said, like, hey, will my name be in there? And they're like, well, we don't always do that, but we can, you know, but it was like Getty Images, Michael Binsky photography, whatever. I'm like, this is so cool. Um, so we went to watch it and I didn't had no idea where it was in the movie. But there was just this big scene where Loki. um looks like he dies like apparently and they and you can see, I could see this planet the color was kind of reminiscent of that storm which was kind of apocalyptic like oranges greenish tones and I'm like this feels like the spot and there was like dust swirling the background of Chris Hemsworth the music got all big and dramatic and they pan back and it's like the whole top half of the screen was like my time lapse swirling oh. over this planet and then Thor and Loki and Jane are all like kind of tiny because and, and I was like oh my god and I had eight friends that went with me to see it that night and they're all looking at me and they're like is that it is that it and I'm like that's it that's it <laughs> I've been crying like a red. baby oh I was so excited and then, it, and then and then we stayed you know you stayed at the end of the movie at, at Marvel movies for the post credit scene and then my name popped up during the credits and we all just start cheering really loud in the theater and everybody's looking around like they, you know, missed some big <laughs> like Easter Thor's egg. Like sitting there and they yeah. didn't know it. Yeah, yeah, they had no idea what they just missed and we were just like not saying oh, anything. Good for fun. you. Yeah, that was real. That was, um, that was amazing. Um, I got on some local news interviews for that. <laughs> that was really fun. That's nice. That's I'm so guessing amazing. Your follower, your follower numbers went up quite a bit, didn't they? Well, you know, it's one of those things that it was, it, it was more, um, like street cred, which, you know, there, there's, there's the old photography thing that people tell you that is never do anything for credit. It's so, you know, you got to get paid for your work. Don't do anything credit. It doesn't help. I've had my name on NBC nightly news with like dust storm footage or the weather channel. And it's not like, you know, my followers go skyrocketing the next day when my name appears on like NBC nightly news next to a video. Um, so I don't, I know though that, you know, one time I ran into a storm chaser to, at a restaurant in Denver and they, I walk in and they go, Thor. <laughs> and I was like, I go, that was more worth it, you know, for the street cred of kind of permanently you have your name in this movie and it's a Marvel movie and I love. Granted, it's one of the uh, probably lowest rated <laughs> Marvel movies, but I love Thor. It so. was L a great lowest Thor. rated by how many million, though, still saw it. So, yeah, let, let's no, be that, no, it's very, very true. It's very let's true. Be honest. Yeah, so, I haven't seen Thor 2 yet, and I tell you what, well, guess what the next movie on my list is. I swear, I'm going to see it I've seen it, it Mike. It's now. awesome. 
yeah it's not horrible there's been there's been worse there's been worse but it was um that was a great that was a huge moment so i was pretty excited well mike yeah, thanks so me... much for oh go ahead serena sorry <laughs> No, I was just going to say, you told me the movie has Chris Hemsworth in a super self thunderstorm. I yeah. a I'm pretty sure. How bad could this be? This, I'm pretty sure he's shirtless at some, he's shirtless at some point in it. Yeah. In, in, yeah. In, in the theater the that night. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Well, hey, on that note, uh, Mike, thanks again for, for taking the time and, and sharing your time with us today. For, Absolutely. For Thank you guys Mike. for doing this. This is really awesome. I appreciate it. I hope it goes well. Um, how, where, where's the best place uh, someone can find you? Some of your uh, footage oh, just. Just look up Mike Olbinski and, um, and all the places, YouTube and Instagram, et cetera, and um, you'll find me. Very good. I, I do want to shout out. We do have an anonymous donor that donated uh, another $50 to the cause. Aww, so thanks thank to you. whoever that happened to be. Awesome. Uh, we're continuing to, to kind of roll on with the telethon, but just want to remind everybody that, you know, all of these guests that are joining us today are, are donating their time uh, to to hopefully entertain, share some great stories, maybe some great education on weather for all of you. And, and if you can help out, even if it's just a little bit, five bucks, anything like that, every little bit counts to help uh, those that suffer from these disasters, weather disasters, natural disasters, whatever they happen to be with the Red Cross. So again, thank you for everybody donating. Um, we're gonna continue on. We're going till 10 p.m. tonight. We're going to take a quick break and we're going to be back with an interview with Janice Dean from Fox Weather. Hello, my name is Karen Kosky Miller, disaster mental health lead for the American Red Cross. If your child has experienced a local or large scale disaster, you may see some surprising behaviors from them that you're not sure what to do about. While it might be hard to know exactly how to be there for your child, especially if you are struggling with your own emotions, it's important to remember that it is your love and support that will help them feel secure and safe again. After a disaster, certain thoughts and behaviors are common in children, such as anxiety, fear the disaster will happen again, worry about the safety of themselves and the people important to them, a step back in certain developmental milestones, such as wetting the bed after being potty trained for a while, and clinginess or separation anxiety with loved ones. They may also be more irritable or tearful and have some challenges with learning or remembering, even schoolwork and chores. Children may also express their feelings through play, sometimes by replaying the disaster they experienced. These behaviors and feelings are common after a stressful and traumatic event, and your reassurance, love, and extra patience and affection can help soothe their worries. There are some concrete things you can do to help, such as listen to what they understand about the disaster, Gently correct any misperceptions or misinformation, openly discussing what happened in an age-appropriate way. Identify and validate feelings your child may be having. Depending upon the age and developmental level of your child, they may not be able to understand or communicate their feelings to you without your help. Provide extra affection and comfort. Provide a bit of extra patience. Certain tasks that were routine before the disaster may be hard to remember or complete now. It's okay to step away for a moment if you need to and remember to offer words of appreciation for the jobs they do complete. Try to keep at least one routine in your day the same as before the disaster. Simple things that you used to do before the disaster can help your child feel safe. Brushing teeth, cooking together, and reading a story before bed can bring security back into your child's life. Assure your child that you do everything you can to keep them safe. Check in with them on a regular basis about how they're doing and feeling. Stay positive with words and actions. Remind them what helpers are doing to keep people safe too. Be aware of your child's exposure to the news or other information about the disaster. 
young children may not understand the 24-hour news cycle and think the images they see are the event happening again and again. Children may not understand the language and fill in the blanks, often with ideas that are far worse. And finally, remember to care for yourself so that you can be there for your children. Identify other adults for your support and whom you can talk to about your concerns. However possible, work on creating a safe environment for you and your child to have the time needed to heal and recover from the event with no pressure from you to be the person they were before the disaster. While it may be difficult, remember that staying positive, routine, and providing a little extra TLC can make a huge difference in your child's resilience after a disaster. If you are concerned about your child in recovery, there are people who can help. Ask, that's the first step. If you would like to learn any additional information or to have a disaster preparedness presentation scheduled at your child's school, go to redcross.org slash youth prep. All right, welcome back, everybody, to the Weather Pods Disaster Relief Telethon. We are going strong. It's only, what, 345 Eastern. We're going till 10 o'clock Eastern tonight, so I, I don't even know if we're halfway through. I can't do the math. <laughs> uh, all three of you are meteorologists, so maybe you guys can do the math a little better. Maz, Dina, Serena. You're not quite there. Uh, but not anyway, quite. so Almost. so we, we had the joy. We'd reached out to uh, Janice Dean, the weather machine, with... Uh, Fox Weather. She's a senior meteorologist there. And we reached out to her because we wanted her to join us as well. And she's actually, I, I believe she's down in Nashville, Tennessee this weekend um, for Fox. And so she's kind of busy doing that, but she was gracious enough to be able to pre-record something with us. So we're going to uh, air this. Hasn't been aired yet before. So this is the first time anybody's going to see this. But what here's what's interesting is, you know, I mentioned Mike. Olbinski, who we just had on as a guest, he probably, and this is unofficial, but he's probably been on Stormfront Freaks the most out of any guest. You know, we're going, what, almost 198 episodes now. But Janice Dean might be in second place on that because Janice has been on with us a number of times just because she's great, a lot of fun. She gets a lot about what our podcast is, uh, which is, I, I mentioned earlier, I had already started drinking, I think, at two o'clock um, and, and mentioned, and you guys would appreciate this, right, that, that Stormfront Freaks, we've been known to be a drinking show with a weather problem. <laughs> um, but yeah. but uh, Janice, Janice really uh, gets that, and, and I know you guys all uh, love Janice as well. So uh, I think let's go ahead and, and uh, we'll air that, uh, air that interview. So welcome. We are with senior meteorologist at Fox News. Uh, she's also an author and now also a podcaster. So maybe we've we've inspired her a little bit as well. Uh, but Janice Dean, welcome to the telethon. Thank you, Phil. And what a wonderful idea. I appreciate everything you do. And the fact that you are helping others, you know, is really commendable. So I talked about inspiration, and I and I think what's great about your story, Janice, because I know we've had you on a few times and had a chance to chat with you, but I think your story into weather mm -hmm. is is really unique and really inspiring. So for those that maybe aren't aware, if if you can kind of share uh, how you got into the position you're in now and where you came from. Well, you know, I know a lot of people that get into meteorology had uh, maybe a big storm that they experienced. You know, growing up in Canada, I was born in Toronto, but I grew up in Ottawa. I remember ice storms um, mm. impacting our area. At one point in the 90s, we had such a bad ice storm that the National Guard had to come up to our city, uh, you know, because it was shut down. So that certainly impacted me. I've always been someone who loves science and math. Uh, and when I go out to schools to talk to kids about getting into meteorology, you know, I, I encourage them to do well in science and math. I was just telling somebody this the other day that I was really smart in math up until sixth grade, uh, where I was doing enhanced math and, and loved it, really excited about it. But then when I got into high school, I had this one teacher 
Mr. Mm. Rowan. Oh, yeah. uh, and he, I think I, I didn't do well on a test and he kind of put me, pulled me aside and said, you know, math might not be your thing. And I just remember that day, it kind of changed my trajectory a little bit, right? Because before I was really pumped up, yes, I'm good in math. Yes, I'm good in science. And then I was like, mm, maybe I'm not. But circle back to when I started taking meteorology classes again, when I got to Fox, um, and I was really good in math. I mean, we had to do the thermodynamics. Obviously, that's the component yeah. in broadcast meteorology. Yeah. And I loved it. Ooh. I loved it when I got wow. the right answer. I also love statistics. That's something that we also had to take. So, you know, I tell this story because it takes one teacher, one teacher to really like make you feel great and want to do something. Also one teacher to kind of make you think that you're not good at something. Um, so. I think it's really important. I remember all the great teachers that I've had over the years. And when I came to Fox, you know, I majored in broadcast, uh, radio, television, broadcasting. I started in journalism in university in Canada, and I was really upset that I couldn't get behind the scenes or in front of the camera or write my own stuff until fourth or fifth year in university. Wow. So I was very wow. discouraged by that, right? Um, so I took a year off to kind of figure it out. And I knew that I wanted to get into broadcasting and I loved radio. I loved being able to tell a story with my voice. So there was a, a college in my, my neighborhood, uh, Algonquin College. I took radio, television, broadcasting. I signed up and I loved it. I loved everything about it. The teachers were in the industry. So if you were a good student, they wanted to help you out. And that's exactly what happened. I started in radio. I worked at a lot of different uh, radio stations. I did news. I was a reporter. I also DJed. Um, so I had sort of that, that basis of broadcasting, being able mm -hmm. to tell a story. And so I did that for a few years. Um, and then I had a news director in my hometown say, I was doing a telethon, uh, I remember, and representing oh. the radio station. And he said, you know, you're good on television. Would you like to come in and fill in for our weather guy? Uh, and I was just like, oh, that's an interesting job. I never thought about something like that. So that's kind of how I started. I was a fill-in, but at the time, 30 years ago, you didn't need the, you know, the, the educational background that you need right. now to be a meteorologist. So that's how I kind of got into starting doing weather is my hometown. And I was doing it part-time. And I remember we had to, you know, we had to draw our own cold fronts and areas of low pressure and high pressure on the system that took a, took hours artistic, to upload. Artistic Do, skills. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so I didn't love that part of it, but I did love, you know, delivering a forecast on television. So when I came to Fox many years later, uh, actually, this is my 20th year here, by the way. So well, congratulations. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Great. January 5th will be my 20th year at okay. Fox. Um, they hired me as, you know, weather presenter, uh, weather reporter. Um, and then I went back to school, which is what, a, you know, a, f a few of my friends did. They majored in something else, but they got into television and then they maybe didn't fit the mold of a news anchor or a news reporter. And they maybe had an entertainment reporter already. So my boss at the time was like, have you ever done the weather before? And I was like, as a matter of fact, <laughs> I have. Um, and so that's kind of how it started. And then I went to, you know, Mississippi State, uh, did the broadcast meteorology courses there uh, and got my seal of approval many years ago. So I did it backwards, but it's not because I didn't have an interest in weather. I just did it, you know, differently from everyone else. But I will tell you this, and I do encourage people that want to become broadcast meteorologists is to do radio, uh, do reporting, um, write the news, because all of those things I felt gave me more confidence and, and made me the broadcaster that I am today. Sure. That's a good point. Very good point. I know uh, your meteorological background, you have responded or been a part of a group uh, post-Hurricane Harvey down in Houston. Um, so you've seen the effect that uh, weather disasters can bring to cities and communities, I guess. Tell, tell me what was most memorable about that experience uh, down in Texas. Mm -hmm. So 2018, uh, Hurricane Harvey uh, was a, really an incredible hurricane. But the problem with that storm is that 
as it became just an area of low pressure, it sat uh, in the around the Houston area and Louisiana area for days and dumped feet of rain. Um, yeah. And that was, you know, for them, obviously, to have a hurricane is one thing, but to have an area of low, just a low pressure. I always say in this business, it doesn't take a named storm to cause a tremendous amount of um, damage. And that's what happened. It was, you know, I think in some areas it was over 50 inches of rain in and around the Houston area. And I lived in Houston uh, for a number of years. So I had friends and who I consider family uh, that lived there that was going through it. I remember actually texting my friend Karen um, and telling her, this is going to be really bad. Like you guys need to really make a plan here. And at one point the water was rising so fast that they had to go to the highest level of their home. And some people were, you know, uh, taking an ax and going onto their roof because it was rising so fast and furious. Um, but the after effects of that, uh, the impact was enormous, especially across areas that didn't have flood insurance. So I went down to meet them after Hurricane Harvey um, and to, you know, see these people who normally would not be able to rebuild or repair to go into their area and say, I'm going to help you and you don't have to pay me anything. Sure. Yeah. And, and volunteers obviously play a very big role for the American Red Cross as well. Um, and, and I know that's a, a big part that we're trying to help support here. You are a very busy individual, Janice. Uh, you've written a few books. Uh, I've mentioned earlier your own podcast, I guess. What are, what are some of the projects and things that you're working on here in the future? Hmm, that's a good, you know, for many years, I was writing a lot of books. I, I did the children's series, Freddy the Frogcaster, which I'm very proud of. Freddy had five different adventures, uh, a hurricane, a snowstorm, a tornado, flash flood, and a thunderstorm. And so because I love teaching kids about weather in schools, like you go out there and they all want to tell you about a storm that they went through. And I thought it's really important to be able to explain the science behind the storm. And that can kind of take a scare out of it. If, if kids are going through something, um, you know, their parents can read to them and, and talk to them about something that maybe has happened or might happen in the future. And then I wrote a couple of adult books. Uh, I did Mostly Sunny, which is a book about my life and how I got to where I am today. I it was also multiple. I was also diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, open and honest about uh, that. And the other two books that I did, Make Your Own Sunshine and I'm Doing Amazing Things um, Despite Challenges. So I've been writing uh, for many years now and I'm taking a break. I, <laughs> I, I enjoy taking a break. I will tell you the podcast is something that I really, really enjoy because it comes full, full circle for me. I started in radio. I love telling the story without the hair and makeup, which I'm grateful for, by the way. You know, we have a we have a village here that helps me with that at Fox. But there is something very intimate about telling a story on the radio. So be able to do that on a podcast and and meet people and not have to go to a commercial break after five minutes is really awesome. Right, right. Great. And, and a, a little bit of a shameless plug. Yes. And I didn't realize this. So uh, January 4th of 2024. So Stormfront Freaks, we are celebrating our 200th episode. And we're going to be up on... Uh, uh, and at the Mount Washington Observatory. January cold weather but if i get I'm it gonna, we may as well do it either on the poles or or where you have the worst weather in the world uh at mount washington but uh you are going to be able to join us so i was so glad we we're going to work this out uh on the fourth but didn't realize we were tying this into your 20th year yes. anniversary at fox isn't that serendipitous that yeah. is great. And it's a bucket list of mine too. I've always wanted to experience it. So when you emailed me and said, Hey, would you like to do this with us? I was like, of course. And to put the cherry on top and the icing and some candles. Yes. It's my, we'll be celebrating my 20th birthday here at Fox news. Yeah, that'll be great. So, so we're looking forward to a lot of fun with that. But um, again, that'll be January 4th as uh, when we'll go live with our broadcast. Uh, and share some uh, time with Janice there as well. So let our listeners and viewers, uh, let us know how we can find you on social media and, and get some more information. 
Well, you can find me, of course, on Fox and Friends every morning, Monday through Friday. You can also uh, visit me on X. I can't get used to that. Can you get used to that yeah, now? I, we, Twitter now X. I'm still saying Twitter. I know, me too. Uh, so you can find me at Janistine, and then on Instagram, it's Janistine FNC. On Facebook, at Janistine. And then I think I'm on threads too, but that's enough information that you need about me. <laughs> you, you think, so that's, it's, you might be on threads, but it's probably so. not uh, maybe a lot of information there. But <sighs> So, but thanks for joining us and giving us some time, Janice, to help support the American Red Cross and in our uh, weather telethon. And uh, certainly want to encourage people to help donate and uh, give to help support those that, that need assistance uh, during some severe weather disaster. So thank you again, Janice. Oh, thanks for having me. And, and I appreciate all that you guys do as well. So thank you to the Red Cross. And I hope people will give generously to this wonderful uh, organization. All right, well, we appreciate uh, Janice Dean taking some time to be with us and, and really helping to support the American Red Cross. Thank you for tuning in to the Stormfront Freaks podcast. You can watch our bi-weekly show live on youtube.com slash stormfrontfreaks and download the audio version on your favorite podcast player. For links to our Patreon team of exclusive benefits, show notes, past shows, new videos, merchandise, and more, visit our website at stormfrontfreaks.com. While you're there, check out our interactive chaser radar from our friends at zoomradar.com. If you'd like to contact us with questions or make comments about the show, shoot us an email to questions at stormfrontfreaks.com or follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok. Search for Stormfront Freaks. We'd love to hear from you. Join us next time and tell a friend about the Stormfront Freaks podcast.